everyone, Bogotov, and welcome to Mosaic as we continue studying through the Gospels. Um, this, today we're going to be finishing up John 3. I know I said that last week, but I really mean it this week. We're going to be finishing up John 3 and looking into uh, the beginning of John chapter 4. Along the lines of what I said last week still kind of continues in this teaching number 29 and that is we're kind of moving through a narrative before we kind of get to some real meat. And uh, in two different instances today, uh, we're going to be introduced to a concept that will be a recurring theme, not only throughout Mosaic and throughout the Gospels, but we'll even see, um, especially with one of them, becomes a, a recurrent theme for all of the apostles. Uh, you see it in the book of Acts. You'll see it uh, many times in the writings of Paul. Uh, and so I kind of want to give you uh, the experience that those first century uh, Galilean disciples would have had. And that is, um, you're, I want to kind of introduce you to those concepts progressively the same way they were introduced to them. Uh, and so today when we look at uh, the connection to Psalm 8, for instance, it won't be the last time we look at Psalm 8. Uh, and so I kind of want to purposely uh, leave you scratching your head a little bit uh, because of that really in some ways is what the disciples would have been doing when they first started hearing this. But as they spent more time with Jesus, as they grew closer to Jesus, as they understood Jesus uh, more and more, again, through the power of the Holy Spirit, of course, uh, and then especially after the resurrection and the ascension, uh, their understanding of these concepts like of Psalm 8 or of Mayim uh, Chaim, living water, uh, it, it kind of grew. Uh, and so I want us to grow with it uh, as well, as opposed to just spending two full weeks looking at all the places in Scripture where living water is or all the places the New Testament references Psalm 8, uh, I want you to kind of discover it the way the disciples did, which means sometimes you may be like, oh, I'm, I'm not making that connection, I'm not following that. Good, right? Imagine yourself on the shores of the Sea of Galilee at that time going, uh, yeah, Jesus kind of left me in the dark there because we will be coming back to these things. We will be circling around or spiraling around a lot of times in each spiral around we get tighter and tighter and tighter. So I just want to uh, throw that out as we're kind of in this transition period uh, in the narratives uh, of the Gospels. So with that, I do want to begin with uh, prayer for sure. Uh, so let's bow our heads for prayer. Blessed Lord, who has caused all holy scriptures to be written for our learning, and grant that we would so hear them, read, mark, learn, and inwardly digest them, so that by patience and comfort of your holy word, we would embrace and ever hold fast the blessed hope of everlasting life, which you have given to us in our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. In Mosaic, we value our Bibles. I desperately, as your pastor, want you to have a living personal relationship with your Bible. I want you to love how it feels in your hand. I want you to love how it lays open. I want it to have post-it notes and, and markings from you and, and revelations from you and date marks in there. Uh, so always bring your Bible to Mosaic. If you don't have a Bible with you today, that's absolutely okay. Check around the pew or the chairs around you. There should be some Bibles there. Grab one. And if you need to take one, do so. We just ordered some more Bibles so that we can give them away. Uh, but we, indeed, uh, this is a service of the Word. So let's hold our Bibles up and repeat after me. This is my Bible. Jesus is who it says he is. I am what it says I am. I can do what it says I can do. Today I will be taught the word of God. My mind is alert. By God's grace, my heart is receptive. The Bible is the incorruptible, indestructible, ever-living Word of God. The 
My encounter with the Bible today will transform and grow my faith. And we say together, in Jesus' name, amen. All right, so let's uh, pop open the Bible to John chapter 3. And you're going to be looking in verses 31 through 36. Uh, and as I uh, did mention in last week in Teaching 28, uh, the, these closing verses, these closing six verses, are almost kind of like um, a discourse of John post the conversation with Nicodemus. It was not part of the conversation with Nicodemus, and in many ways it's John kind of reflecting after the fact, after he's kind of gone through those progressive revelations, and he's begun to put pieces together, uh, and he sits down to write this. Uh, it's kind of that kind of discourse as literary, from a literary perspective, we're shifting from chapter 3 into chapter 4 of John. Uh, it's kind of like his apostolic uh, commentary. But before we uh, get into that, I do want to talk a little bit about uh, the mysterious language of the Gospel of John. So from a first century Galilean uh, Hebraic perspective, the perspective that Jesus would have grown up with, the perspective the disciples would have grown up with, that Jesus would have taught through and so forth, have kind of four main levels of encountering Scripture. All uphold Scripture as, as indeed the literal inspired Word of God, but it's like a, a layer of an onion, right? And there's four of those. And Oh, wow, imagine that. Just coincidentally, how many Gospels do we have? Oh, wow, we have four Gospels. Wouldn't it be amazing if they corresponded to kind of those four levels of the onion? Oh, yeah, it would, because they do, all right? So that first layer is the Gospel of Mark. That's why in Mark's Gospel, if you'll note, it doesn't have an infancy narrative. It doesn't have the wise men. It doesn't have the Annunciation. Uh, it doesn't have the virgin birth. It just cuts right to the quick with uh, the ministry of Jesus, that public ministry of Jesus starting. And it quickly, quickly progresses uh, to the cross and the passion. Uh, I remember I had a professor at seminary, uh, who, and I was taking the Gospel of Mark. Uh, our first homework assignment was to listen to the Gospel of Mark, not read it, but to listen to it. Uh, and when we did that, we all had a very similar experience of how quickly the Gospel went through everything and how quickly we proceeded straight to the Passion. That's really where Mark's Gospel resides, right? It's the facts. It's the story, right? And then the next level is Luke, which in many ways is everything Mark has, but somehow is twice as long, amazingly. And that's because Luke adds extra commentary. Luke adds an extra verse here, an extra verse there, uh, a little bit of hints here and there and so forth. Then the next level is what's known as the parable level or the midrash level, uh, the homiletic level. That's Matthew. That's why Matthew's gospel has more parables than any of the other gospels. They're almost all in Matthew because that's a way of teaching a truth. And then the fourth level is that deep level, that esoteric level, almost uh, dare we say, if it's not a bad word, the mysterious level. Uh, and I just want us to be kind of aware of that, uh, all of those levels, because when we're in one of those Gospels, we need to be somewhat familiar with the avenue of what we're reading. So uh, John the Baptist, uh, as I said, uh, uh, the words of John the Baptist about he must increase and I must decrease end in verse 30 of chapter 3. And then that kind of treatise that begins in verse 31, that voice belongs to the gospel writer. That voice belongs to John, not John the Baptist, but John the Apostle. And this passage should not be understood in relation to the conversation uh, with Nicodemus or the conversation between John the Baptist and his disciples. Rather, it's a dissertation that breaks off, right, by John. And it's kind of that deep insight that John's giving that I'm going to throw out to you today and that we're going to continue to circle back around through as we progress through Mosaic. But one of the reasons the Gospel of John can sound different 
than the other three Gospels of Matthew, Mark, and Luke is because John was motivated to write his own version of the Gospel that reveals the more mysterious aspects of Jesus' teaching. I want to bring you a quote from Clement of Alexandria. Clement is a guy known as an apostolic father, which means Clement did not know Jesus, but Clement did know the apostles. So he is, that's why he's an apostolic father. So Clement was primarily taught by Peter, but he also knew John and the other apostles. And so Clement writes uh, about what he learned from the apostles. And one of the things he writes about that he learned from John is this. He says, last of all, he was discussing why the various gospels were written the way they were written, uh, kind of what I gave you a summary of earlier. And he says, last of all, John perceiving that the external facts had been made plain in the gospel, meaning Matthew, Mark, and Luke, uh, man, they got you the story. They, you, you read those you know the story. Oh, you can make a mini-series called The Chosen about it, right? right? It's, you've got it. And so John felt, I don't need to write about that. Instead, being urged by his friends and inspired by the Spirit, he composed a spiritual gospel, right? So that's the level that John is writing at. And I want to unpack what I mean by that uh, because that will help us look at verses 31 through 36. Matthew, Mark, and Luke, often called the synoptic gospels. Synoptic comes from the, the Greek word sin and optic, which means with the eye. See with the same eyes. They're very similar. They speak primarily of the kingdom of heaven with words like this. Repent, uh, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. The gospel of John will use the same message, but he won't speak that way. The way John will speak in his theological, philosophical, spiritual way, uh, he would say something, you know, a different along the lines of instead of repent or quit sinning and turn, he would say whoever comes to the light, whoever lives by the truth comes into the light. And everyone who loves the light loves the sun. And everyone who hates evil hates the light, Right? That's really the same thing, believe it or not, as repent, the kingdom of heaven is at hand, right? But you see how John is using a much more theosophical kind of language, um, very much in the line of another first century Jewish commentator of scripture named Philo, P-H-I-L-O, Philo. Philo did a lot of commentaries on the Old Testament, but he did so from kind of John's style. Uh, and so just be aware that uh, John takes the simple truth and then he goes deeper. He gets his shovel out and he goes into the ground and he brings out more spiritual implications. Okay? So with that, let's look at John chapter... Oops. Did I, somewhere. Here we go. John chapter 31. Let's read this text together. The one who comes from above is exalted over all, but one from the earth is from the earth, and of the earth he will speak. The one who comes from heaven is exalted over all, right? And you're like, oh yeah, like John likes to kind of wax poetic, right? John likes to talk deep, and you just see that right there. But here is where understanding a first century Galilean approach to Scripture can help us begin to make sense of what John is talking about here. That is, John is actually echoing Scripture. He's quoting or alluding to passages in the Old Testament and applying them to Jesus. Uh, it's just we have to be able to catch where he's throwing in those quotes and where he's throwing in those echoes. And often they are from passages that have been historically well before Jesus was ever on earth and his incarnation, well before uh, the apostles were ever born. They were passages of Scripture that were understood to be messianic, 
are prophecies of the Messiah, are describing the Messiah. And then the, the Gospels and Paul and Peter and their writings uh, begin to web them into their discussion of Jesus to show how Jesus is filling these passages full. So John uh, 3, verses 31 through 36 draws on a very early tradition uh, that preceded the apostles, but that the apostles clearly latch onto, that contrasted Adam, that first earthly human being, the earthly Adam, the first Adam, uh, contrast with Jesus, the, the heavenly Adam, uh, the second Adam, okay? And Paul you will use this in his epistles. I'll give you one quick example. 1 Corinthians 15, beginning in verse 47. The first man, and remember last week we learned the Hebrew word for man is Adam. So you could read uh, 1 Corinthians 15, 47 as the first Adam is from the earth. He's earthy. The second Adam is from heaven. As is the earthy, so also those who are earthy. And as is the heavenly, so also those who are heavenly. And so the tradition in incorporates this, what I would call an apostolic midrash, an apostolic commentary on Psalm chapter 8. And so your homework for this week, if you're so inclined, is to really study Psalm 8. And, and try to imagine yourself. This is the best way, I think, to get to know Jesus again, especially if, if you've had a point in your spiritual life where it feels kind of blah or you think you know everything about Jesus or you think you've heard the stories before. Go back to being like that disciple when Jesus was just revealing himself to them. And read Psalm 8. And then ask yourself the question. Don't read the Gospels or Paul yet. Read Psalm 8 and go, how in the world would I, hearing Jesus speak on the shores of the Galilee, how would I, seeing Jesus do a miracle, how would I, encountering Jesus on the Temple Mount at a festival, how in the world would this psalm come to my mind? Would it even come to your mind, right? But it clearly came to the minds of all the apostles, which meant it was probably most certainly clearly taught to them by Jesus. And Psalm 8 is also a rich messianic psalm, uh, again, preceding the time of Jesus. And so we have this commentary, this kind of deep commentary uh, that John is kind of inserting in this place. Uh, in short, John 3, 31 through 36 uh, uh, is this kind of commentary. So I want to quote uh, from Psalm 8 now. Let's read this together. This is from Psalm 8, beginning in verse 4. What is man that you take thought of him, and the son of man that you visit him? Yet you have made him a little lower than the angels. You have crowned him with glory and majesty. Keeping these elements uh, of John's style in mind, we can begin to sort through what he's talking about in verses 31 through 36. He's talking about how the heavenly Adam, the second Adam, the Adam from above, the Adam that descends from above to below, not the Adam that began below, made from the stuff of earth. Uh, because as Adam means man, the Hebrew word Adama means earth. It means dirt, right? So he's called Adam because he's from Adama, right? And so you have these two Adams, if you will, one from below one from above. And though God made the Son of Man for a little while lower than the angels, it says he crowned him with glory and majesty and put all things under his feet. Um, and as Paul would say, therefore who comes from heaven is above, and the one who comes from the earth, well, as Paul would say, he's, he's earthy. So what is John trying to say here? Okay, What he's trying to say is this. That most of the time, us human beings are too caught up in things like our ego and our, our sinful inclinations and our being distracted by the, the things of the world, the, what I call the squirrel syndrome, right? You think you're focused, you think you're moving a certain direction, then squirrel, right? And you're over here, right? Like a, like, like a dog in the backyard that's just about to finally take care of its business so it can come back inside, and lo and behold, it sees a squirrel or a bird, and it gets distracted, and you're like, oh, man, focus, right? 
That kind of describes us. That's just what it is to be earthly. In some ways, it's not even all bad. It just is what it is, all right? Uh, and so because of that, we're not really able to catch all the supernatural revelation uh, that can come from above, that this true, deep, inspired revelation from God has to come from one, as John would say, who has seen and heard, who comes from above. So John is seeing Jesus in this role that, uh, like Jacob's ladder, where the angels were ascending and descending. This is the Son of Man. This is Son of Man imagery also from the book of Daniel. Ascending and descending, meaning bringing down to earth things that we need, things that we need to comprehend, things that we need to understand, things that if left to ourselves, we would probably never grasp. Only someone from above can give testimony to what is above. Um, and so, you know, that's why John can say, though he testifies of what he has seen and heard, no one receives his testimony. Those who do receive his testimony, however, recognize it as a truth from God. And he goes on in verse 33 to talk about how God is truth. Uh, the seal of the Holy One, uh, the seal of God is truth. And so one of Jesus' roles is to bring down for us this heavenly knowledge, this heavenly wisdom. He is the, the mediator of that. He is the source of that. And so going back to, to Psalm 8, looking at verses 6 through 8, uh, let's read that together. You make him to rule over the works of your hands. You have put all things under his feet, all sheep and oxen, all the beasts of the field, the birds of the heavens and the fish of the sea, whatever passes through the paths of the seas. And hopefully now you're beginning to think of the two atoms, and you can see the two atoms kind of being presented there because what do we associate with that first atom, the earthly atom in the book of Genesis, right? What's he do? He names all the animals, he, which in a Hebraic way, uh, when you name something, you're giving it its essence, you're giving it its identity, which means you have authority over it, right? He has all this authority and so forth, but this other Adam, this, this, this other one that from above that for a little while was made just a little lower than the angels but has all of this dominion, right? It uses this Genesis Adam language uh, to kind of describe him as well. And since the Lord has delivered the authority of all things uh, into his charge, into the charge of this son, um, John can say anyone who believes in the son possesses eternal life in the world to come. Uh, so in this passage, for John to believe, to believe in the son, to believe in Jesus, is actually in this passage synonymous with obedience with obedience. And Dietrich Bonhoeffer uh, would pick up on this when he would comment, the faithful are obedient and the obedient are faithful. That on a deeper level, there's a connection to the faithful, to those who are of faith, to those who believe and their desire to obey. All right. So that's all I want to throw out right now for Psalm 8, because we're going to come back to it later and we're going to keep digging in. But I would really encourage you in your private devotion this week, read Psalm 8 by itself. And ask, how in the world would a first century thinker who's encountered Jesus, why would their mind go to this passage? Why would they think after the discussion between Jesus and Nicodemus and the discussion between John the Baptist and his disciples after they hear about Jesus doing his thing in the wilderness too, why would a commentary on Psalm 8 seem appropriate? Then, then you're able to read more than just the words on the page because then you're entering into the story, right? You're entering into the mind of John. Why did he think this was a beautiful transition from those two conversations to Samaria and the woman at the well? This is the transition. Why is this a good transition? I want you to wrestle with that. I wouldn't be a good first century rabbi if I just told you the answer, right? I want you to wrestle with it because you will figure it out. And when you do, you're going to fall in love with Jesus even that much more, I promise, right? It's worth your effort in the Word of God. All right, so transition, shifting gears. All of a sudden now we're in John chapter 4, 
after this time in uh, Jerusalem for the festival of Passover and probably all the way through the festival known as Pentecost, Shavuot, and the conversation with Nicodemus and John the Baptist and his disciples and Jesus and his disciples kind of going on their own in that area, even baptizing and preaching the gospel of repentance and that the kingdom is here, uh, they decide it's, it's time to move on. Uh, and so uh, Jesus, interestingly, let's look at, wants to take, uh, he doesn't want to follow GPS. He doesn't want to follow the route that was given to him uh, in his iPhone. And so instead, it says this in John 4. Let's read it together. He had to pass through the land of Samaria. Now, let's just look at that real close, right? Let's just pay very close attention to that. There's nothing preceding this that would indicate or give any indication, including afterwards and especially with the reaction of his disciples. There is nothing that indicates that he had to part was because of um, M M59 being closed for construction, right? Uh, or that uh, the bridge on 21 miles closed for three weeks, even though it's the first week of school for everybody, right? That's not why he had to pass through the land of Samaria. Nothing in the text, in fact, contrary to the evidence, would say it's anything like that. But yet the language is clear. He had to pass through the land. So this is very similar to the baptism, right? Um, that after his baptism, what it says, immediately he's, he's propelled, right? He's literally, the Greek word is he's thrown up. Like literally the spirit throws him up into the wilderness, right? He's got no choice. It's Jonah being vomited on the beach, which is why it's used, that language is used there to make you begin to think that already. Here, he has to pass. It's almost as if he's got no choice. It's the Father's will that he passed through, right? It's also part of him bringing those disciples along, right? We're early on in the ministry. We're very early on in Jesus' ministry. The disciples don't know much more than you do, all right? They don't, in fact, they know less because you know the rest of the story. They don't know the rest of the story, right? So he has to do this. Jesus becomes well aware of the commotion, even the danger uh, that's starting to brew in the area around Jerusalem and Judea. Uh, the gospel writers make it clear uh, that at this juncture, he's in no hurry to see that course of action take place. He's still in passive mode. He is passive in his ministry at this point. So he decides to withdraw from that scrutiny, all right, uh, from Jerusalem and Judea and go back to the remote areas of the Galilee from which he and his disciples came. How long did he and his disciples stay in Judea? Uh, probably not very long, but uh, when we know the culture, we're probably pretty sure, pretty dang sure actually, that it was 50 days. Oh, how in the world can I say that? Well, this is how I can say that. When you traveled from the Galilee in the first century and you walked, you hoofed it to Jerusalem for Passover, one of the mandated pilgrimage festivals in Leviticus, well, you know, there are three of those mandated festivals, and the second one is just 50 days later. Uh, that's why it's called Pentecost. It's 50 days after Passover. Well, there's probably a pretty good chance you aren't walking from the Galilee to Jerusalem, celebrating Passover and spending the full seven-day Passover festival there, then walking back to the Galilee only a few days later to walk all the way back to Jerusalem to celebrate the second of the three pilgrimage festivals mandated by Leviticus. It was the common thing to spend those 50 days there. Uh, it was family reunion time. It was uh, crashing in people's homes time. It was all of that. But they would have stayed there for those 50 days. And so in that period, it's uh, what's known as counting the Omer. It's not a count down, but a count up. So every day... They make this counting. This is mandated in the book of Leviticus. Uh, you count from Passover, you count up to 50, and you celebrate a festival, the first fruits. Okay? So Jesus would have been doing that in the Jerusalem area, and that's when he would have been doing that uh, baptizing and teaching with his disciples that caught the eye of John, or John's disciples. 
And then when the counting of the Omer was finished and the festival of Pentecost had occurred, the people from the Galilee went home. Right? So that's what Jesus is doing. And rather than traveling to the Galilee by the means of Jericho and the Jericho Road and the Jordan River Valley, which is what everybody from the Galilee would have been doing, and Jesus opts for um, the dirt road, if you will. It's technically a more direct route. It's a shorter route, and that is the route through Samaria, okay? uh, also known as Shomron in Hebrew. Now, ordinarily, Jews tried to avoid the route through Shomron, through Samaria, because of the Samaritans themselves. The Samaritans were a group of people we've talked about uh, who believed that they, they were the true descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Um, But in reality, they were mixed descendants from uh, Assyria and residents of Israel. And so Samaritans were and still are Israelites, but they are not Jewish. Uh, But the Samaritans believed the Israelites uh, were the inferior ones. Uh, I know we have a hard time believing that two religious groups can believe that they exclusively hold the truth and that the other group is the condemned heretics and have everything wrong. But nonetheless, that was the relationship between the Samaritans and the Jews. And it goes both ways. They were hostile to one another, right? It went both ways. Samaritans believed then and they still believe now that Mount Gerizim is where God built his temple, uh, where God desired to be worshipped, where heaven came down to earth. And obviously the Jews believed that that was in the city of Jerusalem, Uh, So Samaritans resented Jews for worshiping in Jerusalem. Jews resented Samaritans for worshiping in Mount Gerizim. Uh, And, of course, they were often up to plans to thwart one another, to cause tension, to cause trouble, to sabotage trips and so forth. And any time Jews would travel through Samaritan, no doubt they were harassed. Uh, They were, it was just... um, It was a bad time, and so Jews avoided it at all costs. So when Jesus has to go through there, right, it's going to get the attention of his disciples. Uh, The route through Samaria made a difference of a day or two, which, again, if you're walking all of that time, it's a pretty big windfall. Uh, It was especially big for Nathaniel, who lived in Cana, very, very much a shortcut to that town. Um, and here's where they would have passed through. I want you to imagine this in your mind so that uh, kind of when you hear he had to go through Samaria, I want you to imagine what they're doing when they're going through Samaria because honestly, it's something I, I would love to do today, right? Jesus is walking with them, and here's what they're, here's what they're walking through. They're walking through the town of Gibeah, the hometown of Saul, right? And they're seeing where Saul grew up. You don't think Jesus talked to him about Saul? Then they go through Ramah, where the prophet Samuel lived, right? And they see where Samuel lived and where Samuel did a lot of his ministry. And then they move to Mizpah, where the king, uh, the tribes used to gather, and King Asa built a fortified city. Then they go through Bethel, where Jacob had a vision of the ladder, right? They go to the locate. Imagine being with Jesus, where Jacob had his vision at Bethel. And then they go uh, and they see the sites where Hosea and Amos preached and condemned uh, King Jeroboam. They went through Shiloh where the tabernacle stood in the days of Eli and Samuel. And they would have spent a night in Shiloh where for the, one of the longest periods of time, the tabernacle dwelt, right? So Jesus is kind of walking them through the biblical land of the Old Testament, all of that stuff, and even more, is right there in Samaria going from Jerusalem back to the Galilee. So it would have been an amazing, an amazing trip to have with Jesus. It would have been Jesus as your tour guide in Israel teaching you at these amazing sites. So let's keep reading in the text. Let's read verses 5 and 6. He entered one of the towns of Samaria named Sychar, across from the portion of the field that Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there, and Jesus was weary from the journey. So he sat at the well at about the sixth hour. All right, so uh, a lot of things I just want to point out for you to notice that we won't explore just yet, but I want you to notice. 
across from the portion of the field that Jacob had given to his son, Jacob. Good first century Galilean Bible student means you need to read that story. It's being invoked for a reason. It isn't just kind of giving you the cool information, which is kind of cool, by the way, that they were at this, for even them, archaeological site, which is kind of neat. It isn't just, hey, they were at this archaeological site. It proves I'm an eyewitness and all those apologetic things we can gather from the text. It is all of that, does all of that. But a reason a gospel writer would quote a story from the Bible is because he wants you to know the moral of that story from the Bible. He wants you to know the details of that story from the Bible because he's saying something in that story is happening and is very relevant for this story that I'm now telling you. So it's a hyperlink. So you're going to want to hyperlink Jacob uh, getting that field that he gives to his son Joseph. And you're going to explore why John wants you to remember that story in order to know better the context for this story of the woman at the well. Uh, Jacob's well was there. Learn and know everything you can about Jacob's well. What did they believe about it back then? What did they understand about it? How did they, what did they do when they went to it? What were the Samaritans' reactions to the well? What did the Jews do at the well? What is still the practice at Jacob's well today? It's a hyperlink. Pop it on, right? And then, of course, numbers are never just numbers, right? So the sixth hour uh, is a quite a significant little detail for us. So just when you read through the Gospels, let those things pop off the page and stop. Don't just keep reading. Stop and hyperlink and go to those pages. Um, When I came to Emmanuel July 1st, 2021, I sat down in my office in the morning and opened John 1 verse 1 and said, my morning devotion is going to be to translate the Gospel of John. All right, this is uh, October what, 9th, 10th, October 10th, something, something around there. So well over a year later, I just now am in the middle of John 16, right? Because I only do, I can only, I only can do a couple of verses a morning. Not because it takes me that long to translate the Greek, because it takes me that long to track down all of that stuff. Why is Sychar so important? What happened there in the Bible? What else has happened there? And why would John be wanting to drop that name so you would think about, well, you know, isn't that where that happened? So that you would then say, well, that's going to tell me about this story, right? Follow the trail. This is the way to really dive deep into the Bible. And I want you to know the methodology more than I want you to know what I think it means, all right? I want you to know the methodology of how they studied this stuff back then, right? This is the thing they did. So the disciples now find themselves um, near, this is important, Sychar. When you research that, you find out, ooh, that's very near a city known as Shechem. Oh, and there's a whole bunch written about Shechem in the book of Genesis, rich in biblical history. Genesis records this as a place where Jacob once bought a plot of ground, where his daughter Dina was raped, where the sons murdered the men of Shechem, where the children of Israel buried the bones of Joseph. Uh, in the days of Jesus, Shechem was in Samaria. Um, so uh, today, Shechem is modern-day Nablus, N-A-B-L-U-S, modern-day Nablus. Uh, And in many ways, you get to experience in the modern day what it was then as well, uh, because it's a Palestinian city that is um, radical, uh, and it it would be very risky, very risky for a Jewish person to go visit Joseph's bones, Joseph's tomb that's in Nablus, right? Uh, So even today, the kind of clash that happens there is very reminiscent of the clash that has historically happened there which is one of the reasons these references are given. What is it about this place that makes it so volatile? What is it about it, right? So the disciples stop, they rest along the roadside uh, by the well dug by Jacob. Six hour, it's noon. The morning hike had exhausted Jesus, emphasizing for us, of course, his human nature. Um, Dusty and tired, not to mention hungry. 
The disciples assumed that they would not be staying in the Samaritan city or entering into a Samaritan home, so they offered to go to a, a nearby town where they would be welcome, and Jesus waited by the well for them to return. About a half a mile to the east of Shechem is Sychar. Uh, it also has the little town, it's called, still today called Askar. Still kind of has the name Sychar within it. It lies close to Jacob's well. It's also very near that place, Enon, near Solom, where John the Baptist was described as doing his ministry. So right now, Jesus is only a few miles from where John the Baptist was doing his thing. And so as Jesus is waiting in the heat of the day, a woman comes to get some water. And this is what he said. Let's read together. Jesus said, give me a drink. His request, no doubt, surprised the woman. Uh, the sages discourage conversation between men and women, mostly as a matter of modesty and propriety, uh, applying primarily to just this type of situation. Uh, a strange man uh, being alone with a strange woman. Uh, in fact, Pirke Evote, uh, uh, kind of a how-to-live manual from the first century that has survived, uh, says this. A man who speaks too much with a woman only causes evil to himself, right? Uh, and so this Samaritan woman would have been familiar with that kind of custom, uh, you know, and for those who are kind of following along in the chosen, you can see different aspects of that. Even like when Mary Magdalene realizes Nicodemus is a Pharisee, the first thing she does is cover her head, right, and so forth. So Jesus being so direct, right, it's it's a impact. It's a, it's an um, uh, imperfect tense there. Like, it's really in your face. Give me a drink, right? It would have caught her off guard for sure. Um, and so by asking for a drink of water, Jesus is kind of stepping over a social boundary. Uh, that boundary that is mentioned in chapter 4, verse 9, that the Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. He's crossing over that boundary. And the woman replies incredulously, how is it that you, being a Jew, ask me for a drink, right? Emphasizes you're a Jew, but then she also throws in, I'm a Samaritan and a woman, right? Three strikes, like, what are you doing? You're Jewish. I'm Samaritan and I'm a woman, right? What is this, right? Major, major crossing of boundaries, okay? Which is designed to be instructional for us. Maybe we need to ask why boundaries exist for us. Are they biblical boundaries? Are they good boundaries? Or are they boundaries that we should perhaps be bold enough to cross? Let's keep reading in the text. Let's read together verse 10. Jesus answered and said to her, If you only knew the gift of God and who was saying to you, Please give me a drink. For then you would have asked him and he would give you living water. Living water. So Jesus answers with a cryptic invitation. Just like in chapter 3, we had that back and forth with Jesus and Nicodemus. We're entering into a very powerful back and forth with Jesus and the Samaritan woman. Uh, he you know, says, if you knew with whom you were speaking, you would have asked him for water. And he would have given you what in Hebrew is known as ma'im ka'im, living water. Now, as I kind of said with Psalm 8, I'm not going to go into a big discourse on living water yet because it comes back around in John 7. And we'll hit it again in John 7. We're going to talk about it uh, in the context of John 4 to be sure, but just know I haven't exhausted it. Um, but again, we're trying to be those progressive disciples walking with Jesus early in his ministry, watching him reveal himself. He's choosing to reveal himself through these steps. So how much more should we get to know him through the same steps, right? So I'm going to save a little bit of the, the juice with Naim Kaim for later. But no, it's a very specific technical term. Right. While it means living water and it technically means, you know, water that's flowing from a brook or a stream as opposed to something that's just sitting there stale and stagnant and, and gathering mold and bacteria and all of that, living water is moving water. 
There's deeper connections that are in the Old Testament to what this phrase is. To which I will stop now so that you will come back next week to find out this conversation on Maim, Kaim, this living water, and find out that this woman, she definitely was no dumb Samaritan. She knew quite a bit, and she was a very good match for the rabbi from Nazareth. Very good match indeed. Very good conversation, very telling conversation uh, centered around Maim Kaim. I will drop you this one hint, though. If we wanted to put this into modern English, right, not a literal translation, but the FIV paraphrase, Maim Kaim would mean consciousness. More specifically, Christ consciousness. All right, so that's your hint for next week.